And I ultimately think we're going to see a real shock in terms of how high consumer prices are going to rise. Why do you think that a recession is coming? Just how bad is it going to be? I think it's going to be pretty bad, and whether it starts in 07 or 08, I think is immaterial. And I also think it's going to last not just for quarters, but for years. There's a good chance that they're going to push this as far as they can. I mean, until the dollar has completely collapsed, and then they just can't get away with it anymore. I mean, most people don't want freedom. They don't want individual liberty and limited government. They 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 just want to have stuff, you know. And 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 that's the mentality. So there's real losses that a lot of Americans are going to suffer as a result of the dollar's decline. All right, Peter. So in January 2020, we started out at around 3.9 trillion dollars uh, in circulation M1. Fast forward one year later to this year, January 2021, we're at 6.7 trillion, meaning that 40%, 41% of all US dollars in circulation right now were printed in just the last 12 months. So what are your thoughts on that? Well, we've had an incredible surge in government spending. You know, a lot of it related, of course, to COVID-19 and to the ordered uh, you know, economic shutdown and the fact that a lot of people were no longer out there earning money. And so the government looked to replace what people were no longer earning by printing money, which is what they did. You had all this government spending, but there were no additional tax hikes to cover the cost, nor did the government try to prioritize any of its spending. It didn't say, well, maybe we should spend less on the military so we have more to spend on fighting the pandemic, right? They didn't budget uh, their resources. They just said, well, we're just going to spend more money on the pandemic, but we're not going to spend less on anything else. And we're not going to raise anybody's taxes to pay for it. So where'd all the government spending come from? It doesn't come from you know thin air. The money has to come from somewhere. And if they're not going to make room in the budget by cutting spending, if they're not going to increase taxes to get additional revenue, well, then they just crank up the printing presses. So that's where all this new money came from. The government printed it and spent it into circulation through all these programs. So I think when most people hear that something like 40 percent of U.S. dollars were printed in the last 12 months, they automatically think inflation. But we haven't seen a rise anywhere near 40 percent in prices for everyday goods. So where is the inflation? Your thoughts? Well, you know, first of all, by definition, it's that expansion of the money supply that is the inflation, right? That That is what the essence of the word inflation is. It's to inflate, right? So when you have inflation, what is being inflated? Because the word inflate means to expand. Right? You're, you're, you're blowing something up. You're expanding it. And prices don't expand. I mean, they can go up and they can go down, but they certainly don't expand. So what is it that's expanding? And that is the supply of money. That can be expanded. The Federal Reserve can expand the money supply and it can contract the money supply. A contraction of the money supply is deflation. So it is money supply that is being inflated or being deflated. And certainly recently, it's all been inflation. The Federal Reserve has inflated the supply of money and if the money supply has been inflated by 40%, well, 40% is the inflation rate. It is the rate at which the money supply has expanded. Now, what a lot of consumers are concerned with is, well, how does that affect my cost of living? How does that affect prices, right? And, and inflation does have an effect on prices, although it's not always to raise prices. Sometimes inflation can prevent prices from declining, in which case the, the, the added cost which is a consequence of inflation, is not just how much prices went up, but how much they otherwise would have gone down absent that inflation. And of course, a falling cost of living is a good thing. I mean, Americans, everybody, not just Americans, wants to be able to buy more stuff for less money. In fact, it's prices going down that enables you to buy more things because people don't have an unlimited amount of money and so as the cost of goods goes down, they can buy more stuff. And so that's you know, a, a good thing and contributes to a rise in living standards. So um, but yeah, I mean, I don't think prices were going to fall 
anywhere close to 40 percent absent that inflation. Um, and I think the reason for that is a lot of the money that we print, as is always the case, ends up getting exported. If you look at our trade deficits, they surge to record territory, especially in goods where we had all time record high trade deficits. So a lot of that money got exported and it wasn't here in the U.S. where it would have been used to bid up the price of goods and, and oh, services. And, and, you know, and so a lot of the money wasn't necessarily spent because, you know, people were locked up. They couldn't travel. They weren't going out to restaurants. So maybe they took some of that money and they bought stocks on Robinhood or maybe some of them bought cryptocurrencies. So some of the inflation went there and helped lift up those prices. So it didn't necessarily go to the supermarket if it was going into the stock market. So inflation can work its way into the economy through various uh, methods. And so prices can be affected in different ways. But ultimately, uh, it's consumer prices that are where all the inflation ends up once it you know, finishes way- making its way through the economy, because that's really all everybody wants. I mean, people don't buy stocks because they want to own stocks. They buy stocks because they think they'll be able to buy more consumer goods with the profits from their stocks. But ultimately, those profits have to be realized and then they have to be spent on consumer goods and the price of those goods can go up, especially, you know, if you look at what's been happening during the COVID period, we've been producing less stuff. I mean, a lot of people aren't working and if they're not on the job, they're not being productive. They're not helping to produce goods. They're not helping to provide services. So the supply of a lot of goods and services is you know, not going to be where it otherwise would have been, but we have all this demand from people who want to buy. And I ultimately think we're going to see a real shock in terms of how high consumer prices are going to rise. So you think that's how it's going to end up with all this money printing? It's eventually going to hit consumer prices? or <clears throat> Well, it always does. I mean, that's like the final resting place for inflation is in the end product, which is in consumer goods. But, you know, when it, when it's moving through the asset markets, People aren't as upset, you know, when their stock portfolios go up or their real estate goes up. Of course, if you don't own a home and you're wanting to buy one, the fact that the prices have gone way up, that's that's a big problem. Yeah, that's a big problem in China right now. Home prices (laughs) going up too high. So when you give government power, they usually don't like to give it back. So do you think there's ever going to be a time where they're going to slow down the money printer or is it just going to continue forever? Well, they can't do it forever because at some point the money has no value. And, you know, there's not much sense in printing money that buys nothing. So at some point they're going to have to turn off the presses. And in fact, hopefully at some point they're going to slow them down quite a bit. Um, But, you know, we'll see how long they can resist doing that because doing it involves a lot of pain, short term pain, uh, economically, politically, that our leaders really don't want. And of course, if you look at all of the promises that they've made to the voters that can't possibly be paid for, rather than admit that, you know, none of this can, you know, is affordable, they can just print the money and and act as if, you know, the government can provide these things. So, you know, given the, the type of leaders we have and their philosophy and their, the base you know, there's a good chance that they're going to push this as far as they can. I mean, until the dollar has completely collapsed and then they just can't get away with it anymore. Yes. Yeah, so you think there's a good chance that they're just going to continue until the dollar collapses and they're not going to try to stop it before it happens? Right. I, you know, it's it's the dollar crash that kind of brings the problem to a head and turns it into a crisis. So before that happens, <clears throat> there's really no incentive for anybody to change. Yeah. Because as long as they can print money and people will accept it and the value doesn't go down too much, well, they'll just keep doing it rather than being honest with the public and accepting the consequences. So what does a dollar crash look like to the everyday person? Because, you know, we hear that term thrown around every now and then, but at least for me, it doesn't really click. Like, what is the effect of that? What does that look like at the ground? Well, the dollar is what you have to trade to buy a goods and services. I mean, we're not, you know, bartering. People aren't just, you know, providing, you know, exchanging what they produce directly for what somebody else produces. 
you produce something and you get paid dollars for, for producing. And now when you want to buy stuff, you know, that other people produced, well, you give them some of the dollars you earned. And if they want to buy the stuff that you help produce, well, they pay with the dollars that, that they earn. So if the dollar loses value, then all the dollars that we've saved buy a lot less and all the dollars that we're earning buy a lot less. Now, of course, we can try to adjust because if the dollar really crashes, you know, and you have a job, you can go to your boss and say, hey, you know, you got to give me a raise. I'm not going to keep working and giving you all this labor, you know, for the same amount of dollars that you were giving me before, because I can't hardly buy anything. You need to you need to double my salary or triple my salary because otherwise I'm you know, no point in working. And and so yeah, and your employer may be able to do that to the extent that he can go to all of his customers and say, hey, yeah, I got to double my prices or triple my prices because, you know, the dollars crashed. It's not worth what it used to worth, be worth. So for people that have current income, you know, there may be some ability to recapture the lost value of the dollar by adjusting your earnings so that you're earning more dollars. But for the money you've already saved, right, people that have set aside money that they earned in the past, that 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 supply of money is is fixed, especially if it's, you know, in bonds or in a pension or some type of fixed income where, you know, you're just getting a set amount of money on a weekly or monthly basis. And that's what you have. And that doesn't change. And so if inflation, you know, causes prices to double or triple or quadruple, but you're just getting the same amount of dollars. Well, you know, you, you can you can't buy the same amount of stuff. Maybe you can only buy a quarter of what you used to be able to buy. And that is a huge loss. I mean, that's like losing 75% of your money. I mean, even though you still have your money, it only has 25% of its buying power. So there's real losses that a lot of Americans are going to suffer as a result of the dollar's decline. Right. I've been looking at other cases of hyperinflation, and most of them, the government either ends up issuing a new currency, they adopt a foreign <clears throat> currency, what do you think is going to happen if the U.S. dollar crashes? Like, is there going to be a new U.S. dollar or are we going to adopt some other currency? Well, first of all, I mean, there's a difference between maybe a crash where it loses 50, 60, 70, 80 percent, which would be pretty big, and hyperinflation. I mean, hyperinflation, and you lose, you know, like 99 percent or more. I mean, that's I mean, there's a big difference. I mean, that's not just a crash. That's just complete wipeout of the currency. And, you know, the prices, you know, you know, you could go infinity, right? So hopefully we don't have real hyperinflation in the Weimar Republic, you know, Zimbabwe sense of the word, right? Where we have trillion dollar bills, right? That That is the worst possible outcome. I'm not saying that's impossible and that we couldn't go there because, you know, we could. But hopefully, you know, before it gets anywhere near that bad, we do do what's necessary to stop the bleeding, which, again, is going to be a major, major financial crisis. And it's going to cause a lot of problems in order to do the right thing, which is why um, politicians resist doing it as long as they they possibly can. But um, I mean, if there was a hyperinflation, you know, what would the government do to reinstill confidence in the dollar? Um, personally, I think the only thing that would really do it would be a return to a gold standard. I mean, I think you have to back the dollar by something. You can't just lop off a few zeros and say, here, here's a brand new dollar, you know, trust this one. You know, what a lot of these other countries have done that have had high rates of inflation, when they introduce a new currency, they, maybe they peg it to the dollar or they do something to try to introduce some external discipline to try to convince the public that, hey, it's different this time. You know, this is really, it's not the same peso as it was before or whatever. Um, but, you know, obviously, you know, we're not going to be able to peg our currency to, you know, the euro or, you know, the yen or something like that. So I think the, the way to reestablish confidence in a fiat currency is to move away from a fiat currency and go back to real currency and say, hey, these new dollars are backed by gold, which, by the way, is the way it used to be before 1971. So we're just going to go back on the gold standard that the country was on until 1971. And now the dollar is once again as good as gold. And here's a new exchange rate, which obviously is not going to be, you know, 40 to 40 to one or, you know, 40 dollars 
gets an ounce of gold or 42, whatever we left it off at. You know, it was 35 for a long time, but then Nixon had a couple of devaluations before uh, just, you know, severing the, 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 the link completely. But I think we go back to, to that. I mean, I just don't see any other way if we get into a massive and even without hyperinflation, even just a big drop in the dollar, the way to put in a floor to stop the dollar from falling and to reestablish confidence in the currency is to back it by something, because then there has to be some fiscal discipline. You know, the, the government just can't print money and stay on a gold standard. I mean, that's why we left the gold standard in 1971, because the government didn't want the fiscal discipline anymore. It wanted to keep running deficits, but they couldn't do it because of the gold standard. So they had to go off the gold standard. So now we have to push the government back on the gold standard, and that will force them to cut government spending and live beyond their me- within their means and therefore maintain the purchasing power of the currency. All right. So on the topic of getting back on the gold standard, so you're running for uh, for office as a politician. The other guy you're running up against is exclaiming that if you vote for me, I'm going to give you free stuff, more stimulus checks. But you're the proponent of we're going to get back on the gold standard. How's that <laughs> argument ever going to win against? Well, it's not, it's, it's not going to win. I mean, that, no, that's why nobody's making that argument, because <laughs> it's not because it's a loser, especially in a democracy. No, the public's not going to be ready for a gold standard until it's a complete economic disaster. Okay, that's why I was so, going to ask. So now you have to fast forward to a different environment where somebody is promising more of the same and, and what you've already got is a complete disaster. And somebody says, look, I, I have an idea that, you know, something different, instead of just destroying the value of our money and, and us printing up a bunch of money and giving it to you and it has no value, you know, why don't we you know, go back on a gold standard? And, uh, and change the, the dynamics here. So, yeah, I, I don't think it's going to work until the public is desperate enough to, you know, to respond to it. Because as long as they think they can get something for nothing, that's what they want. But once they realize that they can't get something for nothing, that the promises are worthless or as worthless as the money, then there may be a critical mass of voters that finally wakes up and, you know, is willing to consider alternatives. Yeah, because that's what I was leaning towards. If there's no like mass education in the public, all of a sudden that it's going to take hard times for them to accept something like a gold standard over free stuff. Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, most people don't want freedom. They don't want individual liberty and limited government. They they, they just want to have stuff, you know, and, and, and that's the mentality. And of course, it sounds great. I mean, yeah. I mean, if I don't have to be dependent on myself, if I don't have to rel- be self-reliant, if the government is just going to provide me with the things that I need and the things that I want, well, that's that, I, that's the road I want to take. That's a lot easier than to have to do it myself. So, you know, it's unfortunate that the nature, you know, the character of Americans has been transformed so much over the generations. Because once a ton of, a ton of time, Americans were self-reliant and rugged. Uh, Americans didn't want the government to give them anything. I mean, they, they wanted to do it themselves. The only thing they wanted the government to do was protect what they built from people who would try to take it. Now it's the government who's trying to take what you've built and give it to somebody else. So yeah. the government is the big threat right now, uh, not other individuals. That's what I really wanted to ask you. So it seems like individualism, capitalism, free markets, it naturally tends to like degrade into collectivism, socialism, because... <clears throat> You know, uh, good times create weak men. Free markets creates like uh, income disparities, wealth gaps, and then those weak men get resentful against the rich, and then they want they hire politicians who want to take money from the rich, and we end up back into like collectivism. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, it's not really capitalism that does that; it's democracy, right? Because the capitalism is great, right? Capitalism is making everybody better off. Uh, the rich are getting richer, sure, but the middle class is getting richer. The poor are getting richer. In fact, without capitalism, there really is no middle class. I mean, the middle class was a creature of capitalism. Capitalism created the middle class. Before capitalism, there was just the very rich and everybody else was broke. Right. So the whole concept of that middle class uh, was born out of capitalism. And, and so capitalism is fine. It's democracy 
that plays on human nature, on human greed and human envy. That is the problem, right? Because whenever you have disparities in wealth, you're always going to have people that resent those that are more successful, that have more stuff. And then you're going to have a politician who can prey on that, right? Hey, that's not fair. Why should this guy have so much? He's not that much better than you. He's just greedier. He just doesn't care about people. He doesn't care about the environment. He's an evil, mean person who's exploiting his workers. You know, that's why he's richer than you. And we're going to level this out. We're going to tax him. And then we're going to take some of that money and give it to you so you can have more stuff because it's not fair that he has so much. And, and this is what happens, you know, in, in, in democracy. And th- so that's the flaw. And I think the framers of the U.S. Constitution understood this. And, and so they created America as a republic. That was their experiment. We, you know, we could have been a monarchy and we could have made George Washington king. But instead, we opted for a republic with a president, with a Congress. And we had a constitution to limit power. But the idea was to not have a democracy, you know, like the failed democracies of ancient Greece, right, which, you know, our founding fathers, you know, had studied and, you know, understood the problems with democracy. But they thought, OK, we can handle democracy. We'll keep it in check with this Republican form of government. But they left too many holes in it, you know, and, you know, over time, uh, they take advantage of these loopholes and, and gradually the constitutional protections, you know, uh, wither away and, and, you know, and democracy creeps in and gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And, and so, you know, we're very close to the, to the end of this, right? Because it really is socialism at this point. Um, you know, look at Joe Biden's, his new executive order on the unemployment benefits. You know, there's these extended unemployment benefits where they're really lucrative and where a lot of people actually get more money not working than what they would earn if they returned to work. Their employers are like, hey, I need you to come back. And they don't want to come back because it's a pay cut. But in theory, if they don't come back, they're not unemployed anymore because they're turning down a job offer. And so then they're not really supposed to get the unemployment benefits. And so Biden says, oh, no, no, we want to change this. This is not right because people should be allowed to turn down jobs and continue to collect unemployment because we shouldn't make people choose between a job and possibly getting sick. And, and, you know, the minute you adopt that mentality, well, then you tell people they don't have to work. You know, they could just get, they could just opt for money from the government that they shouldn't have to be forced to have a job uh, because jobs are risky by their very nature. I mean, whenever you have a job, you could get sick. You could get into a car accident. I mean, you know, you, you could get bored. All kinds of things, you know, <laughs> could happen at your job that you don't like. Um, and so, you know, but, but we are now setting a situation where you have a right to stuff, right? You have a right to health care. You have a right to uh, housing. You have a right to education. You have a right to a certain quality of life. You have a right to a living wage, you know, whether you earn it or not, right? Everybody has a right. Uh, to all these things, these basic human rights. And of course, none of this is a right. You don't have a right to anything that belongs to somebody else, right? You, 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 you have, your rights are negative, right? You have a right to be left alone. So you have a right to, to be free, but you don't have a right to take stuff from other people. And the only way you can have education is if somebody gives it to you. Well, you, you don't have a right to force somebody to give you anything. That's, that's theft. Now, what what these politicians are really talking about are privileges. They want to say, well, we all have special privileges. We have the privilege of health care and the privilege of housing. But all right, well, at whose expense? If you have a privileged class in America, who's funding it? Who is on the hook to provide these privileges? Right. And basically what the media is saying today is, well, there's some group of, you know, wealthy you know, one percenters, whoever these guys are, and it's their responsibility to provide you with all this stuff, right? They're basically the servants and we're the masters. We're, we're the new nobility and and they're the working class, right? We just get to have lives of leisure and it's paid for by, you know, the toil of these, this small, you know, minority of wealthy people. 
Right. So many questions I want to ask. Yeah. You. So <laughs> I'm reading uh, Atlas Shrugged right now uh, on the last yeah. part. So for people who aren't familiar, uh, mm -hmm. Atlas Shrugged, government gets too powerful, offers free stuff, uh, t says the rich are evil. So the producers that produce everything uh, run away out of the system. So we, we're seeing it happen right now with places like California, New York, people are moving out. But as this gets worse, as the, America, the idea of America isn't the same idea that we had when we started, where do people go? Like, where do producers, entrepreneurs, where are they going to go? <clears throat> yeah, well, you know, in the United States, they, they start going to the states that have lower taxes, by and large, right? That's why you see people leaving California, leaving New York, Massachusetts, right? And they're coming down to Texas or Florida or, or Nevada because they have no state income tax. But as the federal tax burden grows. And I think what a lot of these states are going to be successful in doing is because they can see that they're taxing away their high earners, right? They may be able to convince the federal government just to, to, to raise taxes more on the federal level and just share that revenue with the states. That way they don't have to worry about people leaving because the federal government is taxing you no matter what state you reside in which then pushes people to where I am, Puerto Rico, because I'm living in Puerto Rico, which is not a state, thankfully, we're a territory. And so federal income taxes don't apply here. So if you, know, you get tired of paying the federal taxes, then you can move from Florida or Texas and move here to Puerto Rico. Now, other people, if they want, they can give up their US citizenship and they can move to another country. Now, citizens of other countries don't necessarily have to make that choice with respect to their passports, because most people in most countries, if they leave their home country and permanently reside outside their home country, they don't owe any taxes to you know, the country that they're a citizen of. They only owe taxes to where they live. And if you move into a jurisdiction with very low taxes, then you have very low taxes. Right. Americans are different. Right. We are taxed on our worldwide income because we're slaves of the American government and they tax us no matter where in the world we happen to be working. And so we don't have the freedoms that people have in other countries. Uh, so you would have to renounce your citizenship if you wanted to take advantage of a lower tax environment in another country. Or, you know, you can move to Puerto Rico, which is a lot easier. Uh, you know, if you want to be an American and you can still be an American, but not, you know, be subject to those those high taxes. But other countries, right, as I said, it's easier for them to move. And that's why, like one of the things they try to do in the European Union is they try to harmonize the taxes and things because they don't like they don't like it when people go from one country to another yeah. to get to lower taxes. But of course, that's what you want. I mean, people should want governments to compete with one another for low taxes to keep the taxes low because it's it's the fear that oh if we raise taxes some of these high-end taxpayers might go that's what keeps the rates lower yeah. because they're worried about you know about raising taxes and actually collecting less revenue so even if you yourself are not taking advantage of a tax haven the fact that other people are is a benefit to you because if there were no tax havens, your own taxes would be much higher. See, the governments like to pretend, oh, if it wasn't for these people avoiding taxes, your taxes would be lower. No, it's the reverse. Your taxes would be even higher <laughs> if the government, if it was easier for the government to raise the rates. But yeah, people, capital are going to go to where it's treated better and to where they have a competitive advantage. Because businesses that are operating in a lower tax environment are going to have a competitive advantage to those that are paying more taxes because they have less resources available to reinvest and grow their business and invest in productive uh, you know, plant equipment and train workers and do all sorts of things. So low taxes, less government is a competitive advantage. And so not only will businesses seek it out, but the nations that have that will have be more prosperous and more people will you know, want to live there and, and all sorts of things. So that, that is going to be happening, and, and that already is happening now in the U.S. Hmm. Puerto Rico. I've thought about moving there. <clears throat> Why hasn't the government, uh, 
like attacked it and got rid of the four, flat 4% <laughs> tax? Yeah, look, there's nothing stopping you. Look, I just met two young ladies at a Super Bowl party yesterday, and I won't mention who they are, uh, but they're, you know, social media influencers. One of them is quite well known, um, but they just moved down here a couple of days ago. Young people in their 20s. And, um, you know, I run into these people all the time uh, who are, hey, learning about Puerto Rico. And next thing you know, here they are. Right. They're living at a friend's house. They don't have a place to live yet. They haven't you know, bought a place. They want to buy something. The prices have gone way up. So they're crashing at a friend's house, you know, while they're trying to figure out. <clears throat> but they're here. Right. They showed up. They buy a one way ticket. And I'm in Puerto Rico right now. They're going to go get their driver's licenses and and all this stuff. There's no way the government can stop you from going. I mean, you don't you don't need a passport to come here. You, you know, it's just like going to any state. Uh, and it is a territory. So it has a different tax system that cannot just be changed by the government. The only way to really change it would be for Puerto Rico to become a state. So that is the risk. You know, and that would be, I think, terrible for Puerto Rico to become a state because it would lose the, the best advantage that it has. You know, no income tax, no IRS agents. So I mean, it's like, why would you want that? Why would you invite that into your, you know, state or your territory if you didn't have to? Uh, so hopefully that never happens to Puerto Rico. Um, but, yeah, there are people who I've talked to over the years who have been reluctant to come down here because they're worried, oh, it's too good to be true. It's going to change. Well, maybe so. But I've been here for many, many years and I've saved a lot of money in taxes. And, you know, so I just say, look, if they change it, they change it. But just come down here before they do, because that's your chance you know, to keep to get some tax free money and have zero capital gains. But meanwhile, you know, it's a beautiful day out. You know, I mean, I can go to the beach today and, you know, I can walk around in shorts and a T-shirt and it's, uh, you know, late January. Right. And, you know, that's not true in Connecticut where I came here from. But, you no, know, I love living here. It's a great place to live. In addition to the fact that, you know, the, the lower taxes make it a lot more affordable to live here because yeah. you have you get you have all your money instead of half of your money. <laughs> yeah. So it's not as easy as just the federal government going in and you're going to stop doing this four percent tax. You're going to tax higher. They can't just like go in and do that. Or is, yeah. I mean, Puerto Rico can change it. But I don't know why they would, because then people would stop coming. Yeah. But the people who are already here, they get a contract. So we're grandfathered in. So they can't, like, get us all in here and then jack up our taxes once we get here. They write a contract that says we're going to keep your rates low for a certain number of years. And um, my guess is that'll be extended. You know, it, I think it's up in 2035. Um, but if it's not, it's not, I'll figure out what to do, you know, at that time. Um, but if they were to ever stop the program going forward and say, you know, the new people that come here, they no longer get the 4%, they're paying 33% or something like that. Then the people will stop coming, mm. you know, and that, that hurts Puerto Rico Yeah, because 4% of something is a lot better than 33% of nothing. But, you know, in Florida, the state income tax is zero in Texas it's zero. So if I lived in Florida or Texas, right, I would be paying less money in taxes to Florida or Texas than I am paying to Puerto Rico. So Puerto Rico is getting more money from me than Florida would get if I lived there. So the, Puerto Rico's fine, mm. you know? <laughs> All right, good point, good point. Yeah. So back to uh, the Fed printing money and stuff. So what's the relationship between the Federal Reserve and the federal government? Because I know they started out, it was supposed to be two separate entities independent of each other. But what does that look like on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, you know, they still are in theory. Yeah. Well, I don't know if you ever, if you get a letter from a U.S. government agency, like you get a letter from the IRS, they don't go and buy a stamp at the post office, right? They, they get to frank it. They get to send their mail for free, right? Because the U.S. government owns the post office, right? But when you get a letter from the Federal Reserve, they have to buy a stamp and put it on there because the Federal Reserve is not part of the U.S. government. So they have to buy postage. It is an independent, private organization. Now, there are some public aspects of it where the Board of Governors get appointed by 
the government and the, the chairman is appointed, right? But the banks, all those member banks, they're not part of the government. And the reason that the Federal Reserve was originally created through the Federal Reserve Act as an independent company, which, by the way, pays taxes, the Federal Reserve pays taxes to the U.S. government. It has a very high rate. It has like a 100 percent rate of tax after it makes a certain amount of profit. But it is a tax. I mean, legally, it's a tax. And the reason this was done was because the Constitution does not authorize the federal government to print money. So the federal government could not issue paper currency. That's why the Federal Reserve is doing it, because it's not the federal government. But they also wanted to keep the, it separate for a lot of reasons. I mean, they didn't want the government just going into debt and printing money. That's why the original Federal Reserve Act said the Federal Reserve couldn't even hold or buy U.S. Treasury bonds. You know, and the, of course, the original Federal Reserve notes were backed 100 percent by commercial paper, which was the notes of other banks, and 40 percent by gold. So and the gold was real money. So the Federal Reserve notes were not money. They were money substitutes. They were IOUs. But dollars were the actual gold that the Federal Reserve held. Federal Reserve notes were not dollars. They were IOUs for dollars. The dollars were made of gold and the Federal Reserve kept them in their vaults. So it was a much more honest system and it was totally independent. But practically now, the Federal Reserve really acts as an arm of the government, I, you know, I think in violation of the act and pretty much does whatever the government wants. Yeah. And they simply facilitate deficit spending. And, you know, you, you see the secretary of the Treasury and the Fed, chairman of the Fed. They're all buddy, buddy. They're having joint press conferences. They're talking all the time. They're coordinating policy. They're working hand in glove. I mean, now, that this is not supposed to be, you know, the, the, the Federal Reserve is supposed to be a check on the government, not an enabler of government, which is what it's become, which is why the whole system is going to collapse. Right. Do you think we should have a Fed, a Federal Reserve? Ideally, I don't think we need one. I mean, if you go back to the original uh, rationale for a Fed, I mean, I can see the argument back in 1913 about why the Federal Reserve System may have been an improvement on the system that we had before. But the problem isn't the way the Federal Reserve was in its initial form. The problem was how, what it evolved into once the government got the camel's nose under the tent. So for that reason, I would just say, no, we cannot give the government an inch, even if we benefit from that inch, because they'll take a mile and we are going to suffer as a result of that. So whatever good may have been accomplished for the first year with the Federal Reserve Act, I mean, they quickly undid it. So, no, I think we'd be, get, we'd be better off just getting uh, getting rid of the Fed. But we also have to make sure that the federal government doesn't just start doing what the Fed was doing, because 100 years ago, there was a lot more respect for the Constitution than there is now. So we needed a Federal Reserve Act back in 1913 because we all knew that the federal government didn't have the power to print money. But we don't know that now. Today, we think the federal government can do whatever the hell it wants. Remember, in 1913, when the federal government wanted to tax income, they had to amend the Constitution because people were smart enough to say, hey, wait a minute, there's nothing in the Constitution that says you can tax our income. So they had to change the Constitution. Right. So but now they whenever they want to tax, they just do it. So it, the danger of getting rid of the Federal Reserve is that we just get rid of the Fed and just replace it with something worse, which is the government doing what the Fed was doing only worse. So we have to get rid of the Fed, but we also have to make sure that the federal government doesn't assume its powers. We need to go back to the system that we had prior to the Federal Reserve, which was private banks issuing their own currency backed by gold, <laughs> gold and silver. I just don't see the public being aware enough to like support anything like that unless we have a massive crash or something. Well, yeah. Well, they're not going to support it until, you know, they're living with the consequences of, you know, runaway inflation or hopefully not hyperinflation. But yeah, I mean, things are going to get really bad and that might be a catalyst for change. Of course, it could be a catalyst for negative change. I mean, look what happened in Germany. Uh, they had hyperinflation and that laid the foundation for, you know, Adolf Hitler and the Third Reich. Yeah. Right now. After that collapse, they went to something much better, at least Western Germany. The East Germans got stuffed with the Soviet bloc 
And so they went to communism, but West Germany uh, went in a different direction and became a very wealthy, prosperous uh, civilization over there. Um, but so, yeah, I mean, hyperinflation definitely leads to political change, but it, it, it doesn't have to be for the better. It could be for the worse. So that's that's a real risk. Mm. So for those of you that don't know, uh, in business circles, there's a very popular and notorious book called The Creature from Jekyll Island about the founding of the Federal yeah. Reserve, <laughs> how a bunch of bankers got together, secret meeting, created the Federal Reserve to benefit themselves <clears throat> as like a cartel. What are your thoughts on that? Because the way you explain the founding of the Fed, uh, you don't seem to buy it. Yeah, look, I don't necessarily think that the people behind the Fed were bad, evil people and they had bad intentions. It seems to me that it's more likely that they had good intentions. But, you know, I mean, that's what they say about the road to hell. And they say that for a reason, right, that you pave the road to hell with good intentions. So I, it's not that these were necessarily evil people. I mean, maybe they were, but I think it's more likely that they were not. Uh, but the problem was they created uh, something that government could exploit. And then how do you expect government not to exploit it, not to take advantage of it? Uh, and even if you think you've built in enough safeguards, like a, a good example of how this changed very quickly. is So they started the Federal Reserve Act and they had the good sense in the Federal Reserve Act to say the Federal Reserve cannot hold any U.S. treasuries because they didn't want the Federal Reserve lending money to the U.S. government. They were worried that, that the government would abuse that if it could borrow from the Federal Reserve. So, no, 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 you can't do that. We're not going to let the Federal Reserve loan any money to the federal government. Well, World War I comes along, right? 1917, we get into a war, the government needs money, and, oh, here's the Federal Reserve. Oh, sorry, you can't get it from the Fed. So they introduced the bill to amend the Federal Reserve Act so that now the Federal Reserve can buy U.S. treasuries or hold U.S. treasuries because they wanted to use the Federal Reserve to finance the war. And the war wasn't popular. People didn't even want to go to war. And it was a mistake. We never should have entered World War I. In fact, if we didn't enter World War I, there probably wouldn't have been a World War II, which means there wouldn't have been an Adolf Hitler because there wouldn't have been a Weimar Republic because there wouldn't have been a Treaty of Versailles. And, you know, I mean, all these terrible things would never have happened had we not gone into World War I. But World War I was not popular, and people didn't want to pay all the high taxes, even though they raised taxes to pay for the war. So they wanted to pay for the war with debt, and but they didn't want to borrow it from the public, so they wanted to borrow from the Fed. And so they amended the Federal Reserve Act. But now, here's what happened. So Congress, when they were amending the Federal Reserve Act, in order to enable the Federal Reserve to buy treasuries, they were like, OK, we have to make sure the, Fed, the federal government does not abuse this. Right. So they passed the debt ceiling. Right. That's where the debt ceiling came from. So the debt ceiling said this is the limit. This is a ceiling on how much debt the U.S. government can have. So it won't borrow too much money from the Federal Reserve. So they created the debt ceiling. So they thought that they were creating a buffer. OK, we'll give the Federal Reserve the ability to loan money to the government, but we'll put a ceiling on how much debt the U.S. government is going to have. Right. That's going to be our safety valve. Well, we all know what happened to that ceiling. I mean, every time we got near it, we raised it. And now, basically, the ceiling doesn't even exist anymore. We found a way to legislatively make it disappear without actually voting to repeal it. But the debt is now uh, the national debt is almost 28 trillion, right? <laughs> so we've blown through that ceiling, you know, by trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars. But again, you know, that's the problem. So we can't give the government anything. So we have to completely get the government out of the business of creating money and, and, and printing money, which is what the framers had in mind when they wrote the constitution. So if the US government wants to pay for something, it needs to get the public to pay for it. So if there's a new government program, they have to raise our taxes to pay for it. And if they can't convince the public to pay higher taxes, well, you know what? We don't want it. Then don't have it, right? That, that's what we have to go back to. We have to pay for the things that the government says we need. Okay. On the topic of the giant debt, 
Mm-hmm. So before yeah. this interview, before this video, I really tried to understand the other side of the argument, the monetary theorists. And they mm-hmm. say that since the government is the issuer of money compared to us, <clears throat> the users of money, that they can spend and print a lot more money to do a lot more government programs <clears throat> as long as uh, they don't buy up all the resources in the economy. Once that happens, then you start to see inflation. On the surface, it kind of makes sense. What are your thoughts on it? Well, it doesn't make sense beneath the surface, and it doesn't make sense on the surface either. Like, no matter where you go relative to the surface, it doesn't make any sense. (laughs) But what is true, though, is that if a government borrows in its own currency, yes, it can go deeper into debt before suffering the consequences of its profligacy than a country that's borrowing in somebody else's currency that it can't print. So the day of reckoning will come later for a country that's borrowing in its own currency. But because the day of reckoning comes later, the problems get much bigger before that happens. So that means the ultimate consequences are much more severe. So you get away with it for a little longer, but then the pain is worse when you no longer get away with it. Because the idea that you get away with it indefinitely is nonsense, right? The bills have got to be paid eventually. And the longer you procrastinate paying them, the bigger the bill is going to be. All right. I think that's everything that I had in mind for this video. So uh, one last (laughs) question. So you're going to be at the Nomad Capitalist event, right? I don't know. I didn't think I'm not going. I have no plans to travel. Is it a virtual event? Uh, I don't think so. It's in Mexico, I believe. Yeah, no, I don't. I don't. I'm not scheduled to be there. Right. Maybe right. Somebody, somebody else. <laughs> when is it? Uh, I think like June, May. Yeah, no, no. First I'm hearing of it. So it's probably not oh. me. I might have heard it from like last year or something. All right. Well, <laughs> I really appreciate the talk, Peter. I really appreciate it. Yeah, and if people want to listen to what I've got to say, they can just go to shiftradio.com. And, uh, you know, I've been doing now two. Now I'm maybe you mean three podcasts a week. I've been doing more recently. A lot of stuff's been going on. So, um, you know, if, there's some, if I have something to say, I put it out on the podcast. So shiftradio.com, or you can listen to it on my YouTube channel, The Shift Report. Right. And, you know, you could also look at our my my other websites, Euro Pacific Capital, Euro Pacific Asset Management. If you've got money to invest, you want to protect yourself from inflation, a weak dollar, diversify outside of U.S. markets. You should check out the companies where I help people do that. Also, if you don't have physical gold and silver, you should be buying some. And Shift Gold, which is my company, is the best place to get it. So you can check us out at, at shiftgold.com. Yeah. So what do you guys think about Peter's predictions and his economic opinions? Usually his opinions are pretty polarizing, but I feel that most of what he said in this video is pretty reasonable. It makes sense. So let me know what you guys think in the comments below. If you enjoyed this interview of Intellectual Dropouts, it would mean the world to us if you click that red subscribe button below and the like button too. It really helps out with the YouTube algorithm and we have plenty of more dangerous interviews coming out for your dangerous minds. And it's free and you can always dislike and unsubscribe and leave us your best hate comments below so you have nothing to lose and everything to gain. That is my pitch for subscribing and watching this channel and you can check out all of Peter's stuff that he mentioned with the links below. You can check out the other interviews we've done on the screen right now. Thank you so much for watching. Stay dangerous out there and I'll see you guys in the next one.